here there will be a uh, a reception at uh, five. Uh, Paul, uh, Irena. No, there will be a reception where all the discussion can continue, and we are all in Washington this evening, so I'm sure that it can be nicely prolonged. And uh, I know there's been a number of very provocative points that were made here, and uh, for quite understandable reasons, they had to be uh, somewhat linked to the uh, to the turning point, uh, some would argue. Uh, that recently took place in American and uh, presumably world politics. Uh, I happen to be uh, very much impressed by a recent op-ed, I don't know if it was in today's or yesterday's New York Times, that basically has a different, a little bit different view, which is neither Irena's nor Paul's. It's Orlando Patterson, uh, who basically says this is not something that new. It continues this fantastic saga of American democracy that goes way back to the founding fathers and to many things that appeared always impossible and something that appears impossible happens again in, the, in America. So I think it's a very interesting provocative piece by Professor Orlando Patterson, also from Harvard. Okay, so uh, what I would do at this moment, I uh, mentioned this to Christian Osterman uh, and uh, to the uh, very generous uh, supporters and sponsors of this event, uh, Mr. Horia Roman Batavievich and Mircea Mihaes from the Romanian Cultural Institute, that uh, I will not take the privilege of, you notice that I think I had one question or not even one question, I didn't intervene, so I tried to limit my, uh, my uh, interventions because I was offered by the organizer a, a longer period of, uh, of speaking. Uh, but I'll try and, uh, to limit my time because I think there are many things to be discussed here. So what I'll try to do, uh, I'll present the paper that uh, I co-authored with uh, Bogdan Jakob, who is in addition to uh, working for the Romanian Cultural Institute as a program coordinator. Uh, he's also a graduate student at Central European History, uh, Central European University History Department and I'm uh, somewhat the informal advisor of his dissertation. And he has been working with me for the last two years, and uh, we've been doing lots of uh, projects together, and uh, he has been very, very good in, uh, in helping with the conference last year, with the conference this year, and with uh, one or many conference to, uh, conferences to come. That would be joint projects between uh, some of the major research universities in the area and uh, this wonderful uh, uh, place, which is um, uh, Woodrow Wilson Center, probably the closest you can get to the best uh, to the best uh, combination of a uh, of a uh, think tank and an institute for advanced studies. So it's a great place to be here, and I'm extremely grateful to my, our friends from the Woodrow Wilson Center. I also happen to be for this year a fellow here, so uh, I'm, uh, you know, this kind of double affiliation, and uh, I'm very happy. So first I'll present uh, the paper, and then I'll present a few very, very tentative conclusions I have, or ideas that came to my mind listening to the wonderful presentations. I'm ex first of all, what I would like to say is the kind, you know, kind of um, the, 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 um, how I put it, the, the intellectual uh, father of somehow of this of this event, uh, and I think that in having attended quite a few. Uh, conferences, and I deeply regret that I was not at the 68 conference. I would have loved it, the one in, in Warsaw. Uh, and having written extensively about 1968, and I'll say a few things about that, I think that, and I want to thank all the participants, uh, and the paper givers, and the moderators, discussants for this, because truly, without any exaggeration, I think it's one of the best conferences I attended in many years on issues that bring together uh, the life of the mind and the, poli the life of action. So I think it's it's a, it's a uh, great event, and I, as a, being one of the three conveners of the conference, uh, I want to thank every, everybody for that. So uh, the point would be that I'll try to finish all my comments uh, by, we are now 22, so I'd say by 4.30 at the latest, and uh, from my time, I offer to the conference <laughs> Uh, another half an hour of, uh, as we are together and we can uh, pursue some of the things
things that were said and uh, I regret that the previous panel didn't have the time for questions and I think that would be a fair uh, way of revisiting. So it will be open for questions. Uh, if you have specific questions to people who are in the audience, fine. If uh, there's a time also for some comments. If we can keep them, let's say, in a reasonable uh, you know, in a range of time, would be very good because uh, probably many people want to, to say things. So uh, the first things, I mean, obviously uh, the, the biographical or autobiographical uh, uh, kind <clears throat> approach uh, plays an important role when you deal with the issues of, uh, you know, contemporary or what well, Theodore Draper once said, present history. It's present history. They have this, or recent history, as they call it in, in France. After all, there is a whole institute in Paris that Henri Rousseau and other people have been working, and my late uh, relative Michel Trebich used to work there. And um, so it's an institut d'histoire du temps présent, so IHTP. So it's a whole institute that deals with uh, the history of present time. Uh, 68, uh, as the, as the um, exchange between, uh, between Irena Gruzinska Gross and Paul Berman showed it so clearly, 68, whether we, wish, we want to wish it away or not, it's still with us. <laughs> So it's very much with us. It was very much, you know, basically Clinton was a child of 1968. He went to, to, to England. He worked uh, under the tutorship of a Polish-born uh, tutor at, uh, in England and learned a lot about the cunning of history because that person happened to be an expert in Hegel. Uh, and so on and so forth. So that's, uh, and uh, just look into who are the, the people who make the appointments in the new administration. They are very linked to Clinton. So it's hard to say that, you know, kind of a complete new beginning. And we know from Arendt always the beginnings are a continuation of something. Uh, which doesn't mean that they are not real new beginnings. That they are, uh, you know, total, total or at least they appear to the participants, to the, uh, to the actors involved in the story, to be uh, absolute new uh, beginnings. Uh, I'll tell you a few things about my own experience, because 68 was uh, an extremely important, and if you look into the paper, uh, I, uh, you know, you'll see some references, uh, and there's the background of the paper, it's very much personal history. It so happened that personal history for me interfered with the disintegration, let's say, of the uh, Marxist creed in East Central Europe and in the particular uh, environment I grew up in, in my own family and their friends. This paper also, there is a uh, text which is quoted in the paper. It's a text that uh, unexpectedly a few years ago, I was in Bucharest, I received a call from my friends at the Group for Social Dialogue, which is a very important a uh, very important civil society um, initiative, so to speak, and uh, they said there's an envelope for, for you here at our, uh, our headquarters that the president of the Romanian Senate, uh, which is the higher uh, chamber of the Romanian parliament, sent to you. I said, oh, you mean Mr. Petre Roman? Uh, okay, so that's about in 1999 or 2000, I think, that happened. So I went, I picked up the envelope, it was with the, you know, with the stationery of the Romanian Senate and with a business card, you saw it, and with best wishes, this text may interest you. What is this text about? It's the speech delivered by comrade Walter Roman, uh, a member of the Central Committee of the Romanian Communist Party, in August 1968 to the active of the party, uh, the Romanian Communist Party of the uh, Brasov County, immediately after the Soviet intervention, in which uh, Walter Roman, for those who don't know, it's in the text a little bit, Walter Roman was a major uh, survivor of the, um, uh, of the Spanish Civil War. He was an underground communist, born to a, uh, speaking again of uh, fathers and sons, the eternal Turgenev, uh, you know, <laughs> story. And uh, so he was of Transylvanian, uh, Rom Romanian, Jewish, uh, Hungarian ancestry. And, uh, okay, so he, he fought in the, civil war, in the Spanish Civil War. He was a, uh, an officer in the artillery brigade. And then he spent the war years in Moscow, where he worked for the Comintern, uh, for the, uh, Comintern uh, radio stations broadcasting to Romania, which had the wonderful name, Romania Libera, Free Romania. 
Okay, so, uh, and where he got very close, in very close relations at that moment, friendly relations, with several Hungarian, because he was, uh, you know, native Hungarian uh, speaker, uh, with, with several Hungarian, uh, members of the Hungarian immigration in Moscow, one of his closest friends at that moment was uh, Nogimre. Uh, so they established very close contacts. Uh, okay, then Nogimre went to... Uh, by the way, Nogimre worked during the, uh, the war for the Radio Moscow broadcasting, so it was a different one. It's like VOA and RFP. If Ross Johnson is here, that would be the difference between the two radio stations. Uh, was the part of the story for me, because my parents also fought in the Spanish Civil War, also worked for the Radio Moscow during the war. So what happened? Nogimre went to uh, to Budapest. Became, as Charles Gatti reminded us, got all kind of appointments. Some of them more compromising than others. But also, it has to be said that Nogimre was not a member of the top leadership of the Hungarian Party during the worst moments of the Stalinist dictatorship. He had been basically marginalized, and Agnes and other people who have worked on that can testify about that, because they've been used against him for immediately after that. But he was, among the Hungarian communist uh, leaders, he was the least compromised. Um, okay, so, um, and then the revolution comes. What did Walter do in the meantime? Uh, okay, Walter Roman, because Walter Roman was a uh, nom de guerre, and many, by the way, Walter was a very, very um, frequent name as nom de guerre was in the World Communist Movement. Actually, Tito during uh, those years had the nom de guerre Walter. Of course, there is the Walterites, we have a form of Walterite here, okay, so from Walter Swicherski, the famous uh, Polish communist who fought in the international brigades and was uh, killed in uh, the aftermath of World War II. Uh, okay, by in a way, probably inspired Ashes and Diamond, or perhaps has some connection with the uh, with the uh, novel Ashes and Diamond by Jerzy Andrzejewski. Anyway, so uh, so Roman went to Romania, became for some a short period of time he was the chief of staff of the Romanian army, and uh, the, his real name was Ernest Neulander. Uh, so he was the chief of staff of the Romanian army, then he became the minister of transportation, telecommunications was a pretty important ministry at the moment of takeover of power, you, they matter a lot, communications and transportation, so, okay, and then he started to be investigated, uh, it's especially after the Reich affair, because he had been, by the way, also f f close friends with La uh, Reich from the Spanish Civil War and had Reich's, uh, Reich's um, correct, whatever, recommendation in his own party file. Now, to have Reich's recommendation in your own party file becomes, you know, a very dangerous, speaking of kiss of death, that was the kiss of death. So he was placed under house arrest and so on, survived, and uh, in 1953 made a uh, kind of political comeback and became uh, the head of the party publishing house and um, played an important role in 1956, a very important role in 1956. I recently reviewed the TLS, Paul Lendweiss' um, new book on the Hungarian Revolution, One Day That Shook the World, that came out from Princeton, and actually he refers a little bit to this, and I added a few other things in my review in, 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 uh, in TLS. The title is, uh, is uh, Hanged by, by the Tongue. Why by the tongue? Because the Romanian leader, Gheorghe said, okay, uh, in 1956, in no November 1956, based on the promises of the then Soviet ambassador to uh, Budapest, whose name was mentioned here, I think John mentioned or somebody, uh, Yuri Vladimirovich Andropov. Uh, okay, the promise was made to the, to the Neug legal government of Hungary, who got, uh, got uh, political asylum at the Yugoslav embassy in, in Budapest. The promise was made that if they, they were there with their families, that means with uh, wives and kids and so on. Uh, so about 50 people. So the conditions were terrible because the uh, Yugoslav embassy in Budapest was not such a big building. And you have 50 people, that means, I don't know, seven families and so on, including, I think, Lu was Lukács also in the... Uh, yeah, Lukács was there too. Okay, so they were promised that they would uh, be allowed to go back to their houses, you know, homes. And instead they were the, you know, the KGB Dubas, <laughs> you know, the, the vans were there waiting for them and they were transported to an unknown place and they found out they were basically, after 24 hours, they were in relatively nice villas in the uh, residential outskirts of Bucharest by the Lake of Snagov. And what followed after that was a long series of investigations. 
which were published a few years ago, the transcripts of the Securitate transcripts, where they were under complete 24-hour surveillance. And uh, the Romanian, the, the KGB, General Serov, who was at that moment uh, the head of the KGB, was in Bucharest, and a number of Romanian comrades, Hungarian-speaking Romanian comrades, even the doctors were Hungarian-speaking Romanian communist doctors. Uh, so they were placed, and the idea was to convince Nogimre to to testify first for uh, mistakes, the errors, then from errors to the crime of counter-revolution and so on. Nogimre refused to cooperate. The person, the most important person who dealt with Imre Noy for about, I think, about a year or so, uh, on a daily basis almost, then writing reports to the leadership of the Romanian Communist Party, and then uh, the reports were translated into Russian and sent back to Moscow, okay, was Walter Roman. So he was the old comrade who was coming, trying to convince uh, Nogimre to cooperate. Nogimre also wrote at that moment some of the most important memoranda that he sent several of them, and I'm very happy that Victor is here, Victor Zaslavsky. Uh, I don't know if he knows that, but uh, there were some memoranda that never reached their, uh, their um, uh, destination. One memorandum was addressed to Tito, uh, a second memorandum was addressed to Toliati, uh, and I don't remember, oh, and a third to Vladislav Gomulka, okay, in which what Nogimre tried to say is that the issue uh, of his politics, of the implications of his choices and so on, it's not a matter of Soviet-Hungarian relations. It's a problem of the world communist movement, and he was calling for a conference of, world, of the world communist movement to discuss the two lines within what he called the two lines within world communism, the old Stalinist line versus the line that basically was to lead to, uh, to the experiment of socialism as a human face. He even formulates the term, of, you know, and actually the first collection of Nogimre's, uh, Nogimre's uh, writings uh, that I read uh, in French translations was Pour un communiste qui n'oublie pas l'homme, for a communist that doesn't forget the human being. Okay, that was the whole idea. So, uh, the, why is it so interesting? Because in this speech, so the Romanian Communist Party, and you have all our, our analysis, that Bogdan did a terrific job going to the uh, uh, Academy Library in Bucharest and other libraries to look back into the Scanteas and Lupta de Class, which in Romanian, those who speak French or La, Italian, it's very easy, which means the class struggle. This was the theoretical and political monthly journal. What was the Polish one? Nove Drogi. Okay, so this was the uh, and Tarshadal I know all of them. I know uh, one, one Japanese friend was shocked. I said, "You know Japanese?" I said because I told him Akahata. I said, "Do you know Japanese?" I said, "No, I know the name of the party newspaper, of course, which is the red flag. <laughs> Why would I know Japanese? It's the only thing I know in Japanese." Okay, so uh, the uh, it's interesting that Roman delivers a speech, and he starts the speech with the rhetoric of Ceausescu in the famous, and I'll go into this a little bit in the balcony speech, which is, it's again, it's what a student of mine wrote a wonderful paper for a seminar, which was about uh, memory regimes, memory regimes of memory, memory regimes, you want to call them. Uh, we all remember certain things, and the important thing is how you contextualize. I remember one of the first meetings I had with Adam Michnik, who said, oh, you dislike Ceausescu, and for absolutely the right reasons, and so on. But let me tell you that, and he said it on Romanian television. And said, you know, I don't have the same memory, I'm, uh, recollection. For me, when my father visited me in prison in August 1968 and told me that Czechoslovakia was invading, I asked him, and what does the world say? What does the communist movement say? My father said, Tito condemned, but guess what? Ceausescu condemned that. And said, at that moment, I felt gratitude for Ceausescu. And to his credit, if you read Dubček's autobiography, he says, I know how Ceausescu finished. I know, but you still have to place it within the context of, the, of that moment. So it's very tempting and very easy to dismiss it. And I dismiss it, but I have also to place it within the context in which uh, not the way the legend has been created at that moment and is refunctionalized today in, in, in Romania, that Ceausescu basically opposed and was the hero of resistance to a possible Soviet invasion. We had here Mark Kramer doing a very good job, in my view, showing what a well-prepared, 
uh, operation was the invasion of Czechoslovakia. If you listen to the Romanian revisionists today, ex-communist Politburo members, etc., they would say a plan was there. We have never seen a plan for the invasion of Romania, and it was not prepared an invasion of Romania. It was not an issue. And not, there was no ultimatum, there was no letter in which the Soviet leadership would try to convince the Romanians and so on. Romania was a little bit of an irritant, I don't deny that, obviously. It was a little bit of a, Gromyko may have had his problems with uh, the Romanian deviation and so on, but it was not proposing an alter, nothing contagious could happen because of Romania. The Romanian foreign policy would not uh, create workers' unrest in Ukraine or uh, would not create problems in other countries. I mean, that's not, that was not a temptation that would basically uh, rock the boat. Okay, so uh, what is interesting about the Roman speech is that he uh, says uh, the occupation, the invasion of Czechoslovakia, as Kamri Ceausescu shows, it's a perpetuation of the worst tradition of the Stalinist. Um, in, let's say, in, infringing on the norms of international communist movement, a complete, uh, a complete um, refutation of equality between the communist parties. It's a, a reenactment of the, uh, the long abandoned and regrettable Comintern practices. So he's very anti-Comintern in his speech. He speaks about you know how the Czechoslovak communists were. Uh, doing their best job to humanize socialism, everything sounds absolutely okay. Up to the moment, he says, and there is a problem. You know, I, re I read Russian, he says, I, and I read German and whatever, and I read the newspapers of the so-called brotherly parties. Uh, I never understood why it's not sisterly parties, but anyway. So the brotherly parties, <laughs> okay, so, the, uh, so they speak about counter-revolution, counter comrades. When it comes to counter-revolution, I know something about. Counter-revolution did take place in Hungary in 1956. Imre Noy, and so he goes back and repeats the old mantra about, about, it doesn't work, does work? Okay. Uh, the whole mantra about 1956 and about how the, you know, the conquest, the gains of socialism were threatened by all kinds of counter-revolutionary plots and so on. So this is a very interesting component of the, if you look into Romania in 1968, because Romania, the Romanians, why I'm insisting, uh, uh, because the Romanians played a key role in this. The Imre Nog and his comrades, actually one of the most important members of the Nog uh, group, Loshon Tsigez, I think committed suicide in Romania, and, or at least that's the story and so on and so forth. So it is a very intertwined, I mean, in, uh, the impact of 56 in, uh, in Romania was tremendous, not only in, 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 in uh, Transylvania, but also in Banat and in Bucharest. Uh, the largest student demonstration that took place in the whole history of Romanian communist regime took place in Timisoara in, nine, in October 1956. We speak, they occupied basically, it's completely unreported. Now we discovered all this stuff in recent years in the archives of the Securitate. There were oral, you know, testimo testimonies and so on. So it's not exactly the country where nothing happened, which was the, Im the image created very much by the communist propaganda. It was very convenient. Romania was a perfect fortress and nothing was happening. A lot of things happened. Second, I would say that uh, for me it's very important since the generational story was uh, brought up in the discussion. You know, I, I grew up in a family of, uh, of, of, of Jewish communists. Uh, you know, my mother joined uh, the Communist Party as a student med school in Bucharest in 19, whatever it was, 1933, and she was born in 1915. Uh, my father joined uh, you know, the Communist Party at the age of uh, also 18 or 19. They volunteered, truly volunteered, to, to, to go to Spain. Uh, people ask me, was it really volunt voluntary, apropos of the speaking of the funny stories, because both candidates, uh, so the winner and the loser of the recent elections, many people read that their favorite character is Robert Jordan, and the favorite book is uh, For Whom the Bell Tolls. It was in the New York Times uh, last Sunday. Uh, yeah, it's, which in the Barack case may, you know, it, it, it's not a problem of incongruity. In the McCain case, how does he combine the international brigades with, with uh, a certain type of uh, worldview? <laughs> okay, so uh, yeah, it's very interesting. So it's, uh, there are many su surprises if you look, you know, I always say it's interesting what presidents are, uh, read, and sometimes they are very good books, sometimes they are less good books. It was, it came, for instance, as a great surprise to me, so I would not have expected that one of the, one of the three or four authors that uh, Barack Obama 
uh, favors, considers his favorite uh, authors, is Alexander Solzhenitsyn. That's, you know, that doesn't come from that tradition, uh, I'm sure, Paul. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> definitely not from Jeremiah Wright and Mr. Ayers. I mean, definitely from another. So, you, as a great intellectual historian, you should dig and try to find out when did he read Solzhenitsyn. You know, I, my joke is, but obviously it's not true, but uh, my joke is that he may have read a lot of Russian history and so on, and maybe he read The Soviet Tragedy by Martin Malia. Uh, and uh, the, yeah, no, my joke, the joke comes now. And so then perhaps he, on, uh, he named his daughter Malia in honor of Martin Malia. <laughs> that's, that's a joke. No, I think it's going too far. But you know, you never know. I mean, <laughs> so, <laughs> so <laughs> you never know. I mean, uh, okay, what the name, where the names can come from. Okay, so in 1968, my both parents and my mother worked for the international uh, international hospital in Barcelona, and uh, I'm writing also a book about. So I have all these things in in memory because I'm writing a book about these two sisters in the 20th century. So I collected lots of stories about that, and uh, her, and, uh, my mother and her sister, who was involved in the French resistance, and. Uh, uh, she had two uh, bosses in Spain, and that would be a, a small chapter in my book. So, since somebody mentioned here, I think who, who mentioned the you know the, bar the Barcelona and the students and uh, reading uh, homage to Charles, it's wonderful. Uh, but I think students today would not read it with so much interest. I mean, I'll try. Uh, so she was working for the International uh, Brigades Hospital, and she had two bosses. And one boss uh, happened to be a certain doctor. Is you know, uh, Mark is here, uh, my research assistant here at the Wilson Center, Mark Holland. We had all this discussion because one of the great privileges here, you can order the books from the Library of Congress. And for a long time, I wanted to read this book, which is, uh, I forgot the name, but Erika Wallach Glasser, uh, the memoir, memoir of her being arrested and so on. Now, Erika Glasser, uh, who changed her name into Erika Wallach, was uh, the d uh, daughter of my mother's boss, and actually she was a teenager, and she, my mother took care of her. Uh, in, in Barcelona. I grew up with stories about Erika. Now, her parents uh, died uh, and she was adopted. Uh, I don't go into all details, but she became the adopted daughter of Noel Field. Uh, and she played a very important role in the whole Field story. Yeah. Uh, the other doctor, who was my mother's uh, other boss, she was, so she was a medical uh, school student, very young, and so she worked as a nurse. And there were not that many. I mean, there were many doctors and so, but you know, uh, they knew each other. So, uh, and the other doctor was uh, a young uh, Czech communist. Actually, he was, I think, uh, actually from Slovakia, but doesn't matter. Uh, he was speaking Hungarian any, anyway, uh, and he was František Krigel. Uh, so, uh, since the name František Krigel came out, it so happened that uh, I was in Prague in uh, 1968 with my mom. I accompanied my mom, and we went to, we stopped in Budapest to see some friends of her of theirs, and then we went uh, to Prague, and we spent almost a week in Prague, and it was one of those in tourist type uh, trips, but you know, they didn't force you. I mean, if in the evening you wanted to visit friends, you go and visit friends. So uh, at that moment, Kriegel was the president of the Homeland Front, or something like that. Uh, yeah, the Homeland Front, and a member of the Presidium of the Central Committee. Uh, we are in August, it's before the invasion, and uh, I wish I had understood more of what they talked about, I, but as uh, Jeff Isaac said and other people said, you know, I didn't have that in mind at that moment, you know, to listen to my mom talking to this guy and whatever they had to say about the fate of world communists, that was not <laughs> exactly. But it really, uh, it remains, you know, and then I found out that Kriegel was the only member of the presidium of the Central Committee who refused to accept the Moscow diktat. Uh, okay, so that was quite impressive, and of course, uh, somebody mentioned uh, here, the, uh, Charles Gatti mentioned here the report that he, from some Soviet guy who describes the, uh, the uh, demonstration in front of the Soviet embassy in Bucharest. Now, I was 18, and I remember vividly what happened. So we were in Prague basically between 4th of August and 11th of August, something like that. We came back to Bucharest, clearly my parents were totally in favor of the Prague Spring, I mean, no doubt about that. They had friends and they knew very well Pavel, that was the Minister of, Inter of the Interior, who was also a Spanish Civil War veteran. I mean, there were, uh, so there were many friends in the top leadership they knew very well. And so, uh, and, and also, these were not friendships that disappeared because uh, as it's 
auto, it's not my biography, it's their biography. But it matters because my father was the Romanian Workers Party first representative to the editorial board of the wo World Marxist Review. Uh, and that was a very interesting editorial board. If somebody were to write a history of the World Marxist Review, Problemi Mirai Socialism, as it used to be known, the problems of peace and socialism. And uh, the first editor in chief, uh, I mean, but uh, to forget about the first editor, who were the editors there? Georgi Shachnazarov, Fyodor Burlatsky, all the people who later on would become the Gorbachev boys. Archie Brown wrote two books about that, and they are, the documentation is impeccable. How the party intelligentsia, the people from Prague became the, it's not so, in other words, it's not just the Nekmlinaj. It's a lot of people who were in Prague between 1958 and 1970. And then they went, they were for Pravda, for communists, for whatever, but they had absorbed. And actually we have at this moment documents that Archie Brown quotes, memoranda that Shah Nazarov and other people were sending from Prague to the top leadership, expressing their disappointment with the invasion, and truly they were dismayed by what was going on. So anyway, so, it's, uh, so being in Prague, my father being in Prague, of course he maintained these relations with his friends and so on. And it was a very interesting editorial board because who was the representative of the Italian party to the, to the, the editorial board was Giuliano Paietta, who was Giancarlo's brother. Giancarlo being the chief of the international department of the Italian Communist Party, who was the French representative, was Jean Canapa. Now Jean Canapa, who had been a student of Jean-Paul Sartre, if I'm not wrong, and who wrote some of the most horrible Stalinist pamphlets in the history of the most atrocious and venomous pa pamphlets of the 20th century, became a Euro-communist. And actually he was one of the main voices in condemning the invasion, uh, actually. And he became the head of the international department of the French uh, CP and so on and so forth. So basically, this is very much, I'm trying to say, so it's, it's the history, and I agree with those who said it's a history. 68 is the end of a certain mythology. Uh, after 68, there's very hard to believe in the legitima legitimacy of the Moscow center. It's the uh, Sovietocentric vision of communism is clearly coming to a complete end with 1968. I think this, is, this goes without saying. There are many other things, and I'll go into that. So let me, uh, okay, the demonstration at the Soviet embassy. I remember vividly the day of August 21st, 1968, uh, for many reasons. Uh, those who would uh, look into the paper, there are a lot of references in my paper uh, to the Greek Communist Party. Now you'd ask me if I have parents who fought in the Greek Civil War, no. <laughs> but the Greek Communist Party leadership had his at, uh, headquarters in Bucharest uh, after the end of the, uh, the Civil War, and, the and actually both Communist parties, both the Greek and the Spanish, had their radio stations broadcasting from Bucharest. The Greek one was called Radio Stations, the Vo Voice of Truth, and the other one, the Spanish, was the uh, Pyrenees, Le Pyrene, the, the, from the name of the mountains. Uh, you can imagine. And I know exactly the location on the boulevard, May 1, in Bucharest, <laughs> where these two radio stations were broadcasting. Okay, so the, uh, I was very, very close to, uh, my closest friend at that moment was the son of a very famous Greek communist <coughs> and so on. So I knew a lot about what was going into the Greek Communist Party, which split at that moment. It was the uh, break between. And again, uh, in the light of what uh, Charles Meyer urged us to do, is to link to other, uh, other things that were happening at that moment. I'll put, put two things. One is the coup d'etat in Greece in 1967, which is not that far away, that some people think it was a kind of general rehearsal for a potential coup d'etat that would, at least that's what many West European communists were thinking, including Longo and Berlinguer, uh, that the Greek coup was a uh, general rehearsal for a coup that would take place in Italy if the Italian Communist Party were to basically win the elections. That basically that was like trying to see what would happen, how far can you go and so on. After all, Greece was a member of NATO. After all, there was a lot of American influence and there was terrible repression at that moment in, so 67. That's one element that matters because uh, uh, one of the most, the strongest condemnations of the Soviet invasion comes from the Greek prisons. The so-called Greek Communist Party of the Interior, which was the party of the prisons, of the jails, they expressed tremendous criticism uh, of, of, of the condemnation. Of the, of, the, of the invasion. Okay, another thing, yes, 68 puts an end to the illusion of socialism uh, with, with uh, or communism as a human face. Yes and no, uh, yes and no, because it's basically uh, this, uh, if you want to call it uh, uh, 
Uh, Jan Werner spoke yesterday about looking, you know, this kind, uh, you know, I was very, very uh, attached to an American sociologist whose writings influenced me enormously, Alvin Goldner. And he has a wonderful chapter in his uh, book about uh, the two Marxisms, which is called Shopping for the Revolutionary Subject. <laughs> okay, so shopping, how these people were shopping for the revolutionary subject. They're trying to discover the uh, revolutionary carrier, the revolutionary actor, the agent, and so on. So it's also the migration of the revolutionary center from Paris or from Prague and so on. And where does it migrate to? It migrates to Santiago. I mean, in Santiago, between 1971 and 1973, there is an attempt to basically bring together and reconcile socialism and democracy. Uh, uh, you know, there is a connection between the ideas of the, you know, and it's not basically the Chilean Communist Party that was enormously ossified, it was like another French Communist Party, but the Socialist Party, the party of Allende. And you had the Miristas, who were very much like the Enrage, and so on and so forth, so it, you have it, so it's, mi it's migrating. Probably, I, I would say that maybe 73 was the coup d'etat in Chile, that we see that the end of this attempt to reconcile, you know, kind of uh, the Leninist tradition and democracy coming to an end. I don't think that after that one can identify this type of uh, whatever you can think of Chavismo. It's not the same thing, you know. It's uh, you know, if it applies the old Marxist saying, this is you know, that's th then it was tragedy. Now it's farcical. <laughs> so okay. Um, so the most Im interesting, I remember vividly in uh, August 21st, I waked up, I heard it on radio that uh, the troops of the five Warsaw Pact countries and so on. There was no, uh, uh, interestingly enough, there was no official call for people to gather in front of the Central Committee building, which is, uh, was Bogdan, we hesitate to call it the main square in Bucharest or one, we decided to be one of the, but it's the main square in Bucharest, it's where the most you know, famous hotel in Romanian history, Atene Palace, is located. And nowadays, of course, Hilton, and, uh, and we uh, live in the age of globalization. Everything, you know, becomes, you know, either Hilton or Hyatt or whatever. And uh, okay, so uh, people, at least that was the official story that people gather spontaneously, and Ceausescu delivered a speech. This is entered at least Romanian history and probably East European history, and it was very widely publicized as the balcony speech, where he spoke from the balcony of the Central Committee and delivered a very firebrand, inflammatory speech with no notes whatsoever in front of him. Now we know the transcripts of the previous meeting of the ISPOLCOM, the Political Executive Committee, which is the Politburo, in which Prime Mi then Prime Minister Ion Gheorghe Maurer basically uh, asked Ceausescu to, uh, <coughs> to stick to the notes, very politely. Maybe it would be better to have some written text. And Ceausescu said, no, I, I know what I'm going to say. So he took, so in a way it was, I will not deny that it was a courageous speech. That remains a, a fact. It was an inspired speech and he went as Tom Simons. We had a conference here, uh, the Wilson Center and the uh, emb embassy last year on the Stalinization of Eastern Europe and Ambassador Tom Simons delivered one of the keynote addresses. He said at that moment Ceausescu became more interesting to us than Tito because Ceausescu condemned the invasion much in much stronger terms than Tito. Tito was extremely cautious in his, he said it's a moment of mourning for world so socialism, uh, the flag of socialism is in mourning, whatever, but he didn't use the term, Ceausescu used the term shameless. He, this apparently hurt the Soviets a lot. The use of the term, this is a shameless in, in whatever action that deserves our strong condemnation. What we did in this paper, we first of all, we looked into the international context uh, of world communism at that moment, this is the title, uh, Betrayed Promises, I'll say why it's betrayed. Okay, Ceausescu, the Romanian Communist Party and the crisis of world communism. The main argument is that I, we try to, to, to make is that Romania at that moment is an important actor within world communism. I try to link it to uh, Hungary 56, the Hungary even the, uh, con whatever followed in Hungary. Um, relations, special relations, the three parties, which are very interesting because that are in, the, in Europe, that the Romanian Communist Party had clearly special relations with are uh, key actors in the birth. And here, uh, maybe it's a misunderstanding or maybe I didn't pay enough attention to when Irji said uh, that 1968 somehow represented the end of Eurocommunism. In my reading, and I think I'm not wrong on that, it's the birth of Eurocommunism. Uh, basically, Eurocommunism has one important tenet. The most important concept of Eurocommunism is giving up, I mean, the two are interrelated, and we made this argument in the paper, uh, the leading role of the Communist Party 
and the dictatorship of the proletariat. Uh, Eurocommunism, in its most important book, if I may say so, which is Eurocommunismo y Estado the, by Santiago Carrillo, uh, is, gives up these two things, the, the, which are interrelated. Uh, in this respect, the Romanian Communist Party, in spite of Ceausescu, and this is the thrust of the paper, in spite of Ceausescu's uh, vibrant, uh, vibrantly uh, apostolic speech and so on, uh, they never intended in any way to emulate the Czech, Czechoslovak transformations, the renewal of socialism. From the very beginning, and I think it was uh, Catalina Abramescu in his uh, uh, excellent paper, when she said, you know, Ceausescu claims we don't need, and uh, Christian Vasile said the same thing, we don't need to make all these changes, and it would appear again in the times of Gorbachev. We don't need to make these changes because we already have done it. We, di we did them in uh, 1965, at the moment I became the leader of the party, we introduced self-management, yes, the rhetoric, autoconducere muncitoresca, worker self-management, it's in all the speeches. Okay, was there any worker self-management, even by Yugoslav standards, no, absolutely no, none whatsoever. And so on, so lots of councils and lots of forms. Now the Romanian tradition, I'm not going to give a uh, short his intellectual history of Romania, but the Romanian tradition has this, uh, probably it's in the whole region, uh, if uh, Bibo Ishvan was right, uh, forms without content. So there are plenty of forms, and you ask yourself where is the content, in, where is the substance in that? So you have councils and committees and all kinds of things that sound perfect and there's nothing inside them. Okay, so basically the balcony is in, uh, he delivered a speech around 11 a.m. In the afternoon, I received a call from uh, my cousin who says, okay, are you coming? Uh, am I coming where? Uh, oh, we all gather uh, in, that was in the northern part of Bucharest, very close to, for those who visited Bucharest, I know Irena was there, to a cultural institute. It's in the same neighborhood. It's where the Soviet embassy is on the perfectly named street, which is the Kiselev Avenue, uh, after the name of General Pavel Kiselev, who was the uh, the Russian governor of, of, uh, of Wallachia and whatever it was in the uh, early 19th century. Uh, okay, and who gave the so first uh, pseudo-constitution of Romania. Okay, of Wallachia. Uh, okay, so uh, we all gather there. So I said, what are you doing? We go to protest. And who is, you know, who else is coming? And he says, oh, it's, there will be, I said, but these guys are going to arrest us. He said, first of all, we protested already in the morning. I mean, why do we need another protest in front of the Soviet? Uh, oh, no problem, because the whole demonstration is going to be headed by Valentin Ceausescu. That means Mr. Ceausescu's son. Which I said, I had a reaction. First of all, I knew the younger son uh, pretty well. And second, I said, you know, I'm not going to demonstrate now uh, at the Soviet embassy in, in the company of a dictator's son. I mean, you know, we have enough problems here with this guy because uh, I knew quite a lot about, about the problems. Now, a point I want to emphasize all the time, uh, some people say the Romanian regime became, uh, you know, engaged in re-Stalinization or re Stalinist re-radicalization after 19, our argument here is 1968. Actually, we claim, and I think we prove, uh, that 1968, instead of being the climax of Ceausescu's anti-Stalinism and anti-Sovietism and so on was the perfect opportunity, the golden opportunity for Ceausescu to establish the foundations of a cult of personality second to none, which became the most important principle of legitimation of the chauvinistic, anti-Semitic, jingoistic, you name it, dictatorship that I call national Stalinist dictatorship that uh, in many respects similar to what we have, you know, the Kim Jong-il type of the or whatever dictatorship in North Korea. And paradoxically, it was in inspired by this, uh, as I mentioned, you know, this kind of uh, uh, flaming anti-Soviet and presumably anti-Stalinist speech. Uh, okay, so um, the, um, the <coughs> I saw I did not participate in this second demonstration. Uh, <coughs> I wanted to say something about um, uh, I, uh, we could have called it Ceausescu in 68, I was thinking about another, another possible title, uh, Ceausescu in 68, Splendor and Misery of, of, a Lenin, of Leninist Paranoia, uh, because it was both splen Splendor and Misery, and it was because he spoke. From that moment on, Romania plays very much the game of we are surrounded by enemies. The Warsaw Pact is around us. We need to protect, and again, you have the Stalinist rhetoric of the besieged fortress, 
which is applied this time against the uh, superpower, the hyperpower, uh, you name it, the hegemonic power that imposed, after all, uh, uh, communism in Romania. This was not. But I want to say, and uh, she's not here and regrets, but she has to be at an another event in New York City, but she's also uh, as a scholar here at the Wilson Center, Gail Klingman. She told me, and she, we cooperated in the writing of this report on the communist dictatorship in Romania. In reality, the re-Stalinization of the communist regime in Romania starts, the, the landmark is probably 1966, when Ceausescu issued the decree of the State Council regarding the control of reproduction. Basically, when the, uh, when the human body is again fully appropriated by the party state. Uh, and uh, I always have uh, discussions with my friends who say, oh, he, he, he was pro-life. No. <laughs> <laughs> Ceausescu pro-life. Okay. No, I'm trying to explain. So I said, no, Ceausescu was not pro-life. Pro <laughs> because uh, if you are pro-life, you're against abortion no matter when, no matter what. Uh, uh, Ceausescu accepted for after the first version of the decree, and then it was changed in 70-something into a second one as many abortions as a woman wanted after four children delivered to the state. So if this is the pro-life thing, uh, okay, so where is the philosophical discussion? Obviously there was no philosophical discussion. That was a, you know, kind of uh, children production for the state and nothing else delivered. But why did he need it? Because of his, you know, I call it Lenin's paranoia because uh, Romania was too small and actually in Catalin's paper he gave you a, f uh, you know, a flair of the you know, discussions, and I can imagine that they, you know, I don't think the goal perceived uh, very well because Ceausescu was clearly inti still intimidated by the goal. Uh, and uh, by the way, all the, pay all the photographs that were published at that moment, and because Ceausescu was 5.5 uh, or something like that, not exactly a very tall guy, uh, and the goal was huge. Uh, so all the photographs, when they appeared together and so on, they were doctored in such a way, in, in all kind of ways, as to look the same uh, stature. <laughs> you know, obviously they are not. So, uh, but Ceausescu, what, uh, what uh, mattered enormously to the goal was uh, basically uh, the Romanian maverick or <coughs> challenging attitude within the Warsaw Pact. So basically Ceausescu's position within the Warsaw Pact uh, was in that indeed inspired by Gaullism, and he played a kind of Gaullist card within the Warsaw Pact. His three models, you make what you want with these three models, but in having worked a lot on Ceausescu in this paper tries to make this uh, same case, his three models were uh, obviously Stalin. In his last interview with uh, <coughs> Ken Ottenklaus from the Newsweek International, he said uh, two things. One was, what is your hobby? And the answer was, my hobby is the building of socialism in Romania, which is um, okay, and uh, the s <laughs> okay, and uh, the other one, uh, wha he said, "What is your opinion of Stalin and Stalinism?" He said, first of all, there is no such thing like Stalinism, and Stalinism is communism, Leninism, and second, Stalin had enormous merit. Yeah, he may have some, may have made some mistakes, but his enormous merits in defending the Soviet Union against the fascist aggressor, etc. So he gave the um, the pro very, so basically there was nothing wrong. He was a great Marxist-Leninist with some mistakes in his, uh, so he remained, so Stalin would be one uh, source of inspiration. De Gaulle is, uh, he played a very important role in Tito. So he, this uh, Tito, not as the enlightened part of Tito, but Tito, the, the man who dared to challenge the, you know, the, <coughs> the imperialist power and so on. Uh, and actually, by the way, since uh, you know uh, John Lampy mentioned the name of uh, you called him George Opt, uh, we used to call him Haupt Guri. Uh, okay, uh, and I'm sure Agnes knew Haupt as well, uh, George Haupt. Uh, okay, so he's he wrote a wonderful article, probably the most interesting, and actually for me it inspired my own analysis of of the whole. The dynamics of Romanian communism, which was uh, Aux origines du conflit soviéto-roumain. It came out in uh, the French uh, Journal of Political Science in 1970-something. Uh, and uh, I knew, you know, I know a lot about him and so on. And uh, in which he analyzed this kind of de-Sovietization, de-Stalinization dialectics in the, uh, so the more de-Sovietized, the more Stalinized, which we see the national Stalinism, we see it. And by the way, having reread, I, Irena, I spent a lot of time this year re, uh, on, the, on the web and other sources and so on, and I even wrote for the Romanian media about March 68. Uh, it's quite interesting what has come out and so on. Of course, I read, in including the entries, some of the Wikipedia entries, which are really like in the Romanian case, uh, truly billboard for hate speech. Uh, and incredible what I, I found, because I looked into the leaders of this March 68 and how it's controlled the Wikipedia by basically the most 
the Mozartites. I mean, basically, it's the rewriting in the Mozart style. I mean, the entry on Adam, I mean, they even invented that his name is not, uh, well, it disappeared later uh, in Polish, uh, that his real name um, uh, is Abram. Ab uh, yeah, or uh, something, uh, Aaron. Yeah, I mean, unbelievable. But they rename the guy, he's still alive. <laughs> you know, so and uh, okay, so it's uh, but basically between Mozart's ideology and the Ceausescu ideology, it was it, it was getting shape at that moment. There are many similarities by ourselves. Okay, paid lip service to the Soviets, but not very important for Mozart. That's not his problem. You know, they would he would not challenge the Soviets, but he and his uh, and his inspirers. So I think there is a lot to be said about that. Uh, the scene of the balcony, why, and we insist a little bit into the paper on that, uh, the scene of the balcony is very important, well, A, because of its symbolic uh, power, second, uh, because it was the moment with that arguably, uh, if Romania had free elections probably on August 22nd, 1968, Ceausescu would have won with a, I don't know, overwhelming majority, but plurality of, vo of votes, probably. Uh, <coughs> A year later, things would have changed, obviously. But in, at that moment, it's like Gomuka is in nineteen in o October, November, nineteen fifty-six. There was a kind of national, uh, national uh, identification with with his courage, with his and being the only hope in town. So basically, there was not much. So he spoke to over one hundred thousand people, and he delivered a speech, which, as I said, it was fierce and and uh, the def uh, valiantly defying the Romanian David, valiantly defying the Soviet Goliath, and so on and so forth. Um, so it's basically, um, uh, we argue here, I'll just read a few uh, sentences and I'll move into some conclusions in order to, as I promised, to give half an hour. For Ceausescu and his associates, the Prague Spring failure served to justify the dogma, uh, which remained the dogma until the end of the regime, when he ended his power delivering a speech from precisely the same balcony. If there is a lieu de mémoire there, this is the lieu de mémoire. I mean, the balcony should be just encaged somehow, you know, and, and turned into a kind of monument, because this is the place where he reached his absolute, the moment of absolute glory and the, uh, the moment of absolute humiliation and destruction, when he's booed and he thinks he can reenact the scene. I mean, whoever didn't stop him wanted him dead, you know, because he, it was clear that he was losing it and so but he delivered the speech until the end, until he, they, he cut off, you remember, so I want to remember the <coughs> the broadcasting. For Ceausescu and his associates, the Prague Spring failure served to justify the dogma of the indefectible unity of party, leader, and nation. This became in Romania a very important element, even at the level of the Roma in Romanian party, uh, uh, Romanian Communist Party, Partidul Comunist Roman, uh, which was Pecere, Partidul Comunist Roman. The uh, one of the most uh, um, sung, not popular, but imposed songs of the Ceausescu era was Partidul Ceausescu România. So Partidul Comunist Român and the same PCR. So Partidul, the party Ceausescu România. So identification, complete identification, ein Volk, eine Partei, ein Nation. So eine Heimat. <laughs> okay. So um, we discuss uh, the speech, we discuss the impact, we go into what is, I think, what makes this paper, I suspect, interesting because we tried very hard to link it to the contemporary discussion on 1968 and how uh, there is a trend uh, in and remains a very, Christian Vasilis here, remains one of the most disputed and contested topics in uh, post-1989 historiography and uh, political history. Uh, they are still, uh, you know, the wounds are open, the memories are there, and the people fight for their uh, dignity and for, you know, so basically uh, th there are many uh, survivors of both the Ceausescu regime and the historiography of the Ceausescu regime. Many of them are still very influential within the uh, social humanities professions and so on, who are sticking or uh, clinging to the old dogma that Ceausescu in 1968 was this great um, reformer who was basically doing exactly the same thing as Dubček, but the, f uh, the difference is that after uh, August he couldn't do differently, so we had to you know, close ranks around the leader and so on. Uh, this paper and other interventions uh, of uh, both Christian Vasile, myself, uh, Bogdan, and other of, we are represent a different trend in interpreting this, uh, these events. 
uh, argue the opposite, argue that basically it was an instrumentalization, as Christian uh, emphasized today, an instrumentalization, manipulation uh, of, of, of this uh, um <coughs> otherwise perfectly uh, legitimate and justified <coughs> condemnation. I have five minutes uh, to uh, say a few things about 1968 in general, and then I said I promised uh, half an hour for discussions, and uh, I'll do it. First of all, I think that one of the things that, and we had a presentation here by Bradley uh, Abrams, and I think the Agnes uh, did also a wonderful job in addressing that. From the perspectives, I mean, one of the books that influenced me the most, and if I may do it, let me do it, because, uh, you know, it's, it, it would be only fair to say it, that, uh, and his name was mentioned, uh, and I would like to pay tribute to the memory of somebody who played a very important role in, in 68, a very courageous man and one of the most brilliant political philosophers of uh, my times, uh, I mean Ferenc Feher. I think that what Ferenc did in terms of interpreting these ev events and linking, I mean his, his masterpiece about the French Revolution is clearly having in mind the 20th century. He didn't write about uh, the French Revolution only because he suddenly became interested in events of 200 years ago. So, uh, okay, so 1968 is basically ending probably this, the saga of East European Marxist revisionism. I don't know what happens, but actually uh, there are some continue, there is some continuation. There is nobody who knows this better than the Howard, so I'll not go into, uh, maybe he will say what happens then in Paris. But clearly people like Le Faux and Castoriadis and so on are clearly moving beyond Marxism. I mean, this is the moment. And we didn't have the time, but uh, Agnes, perhaps she can remember for us, like Renan remembered, March 68, you were at that moment in Korchula, no, when uh, the invasions. Uh, please tell us more. Yeah, okay, so maybe you tell us more about the philosophical island, you guys getting together in Korchula or wherever it was, and with Ernst Bloch and with whoever else was there, Marcuse and, and the Prom and whoever else. And how, yeah, so maybe you tell us in five minutes, because it was an extraordinary experience, speaking of intellectual friendship. Actually, I was telling Hoya uh, Padabievich, perhaps we should have one conference one year about inter intellectual friendship. I mean, what it means, intellectual friendship, you know? Just to discuss, I know Irena has done work on friendship. I'm not stealing your ideas, I paid, you know, I recognize it, acknowledge it publicly. Okay, so, uh, so basically we see the end of this ma a Marxist uh, revisionist saga, I think. A second thing, okay, this is linked, uh, okay, second thing and just points. Uh, I think it's a cultural, uh, cultural, or if you want, civilizational turning point. Uh, what, is, what we see at this moment is basically an axiological crisis. It's clearly that the value system as it emerged, you name it, uh, there were references here to, to, to Ren, to whoever, Edgar Morin, at least of the serious left, not of the Badiou type. Uh, okay, so I get increasingly uh, annoyed with this imposter. Okay, um, okay, the second thing I think, well, third, is the failure of the Leninist left. Basically, the Leninist left shows, it's in a famous interview actually, that ma at that time that I think was a, what a bit earlier with Ernst Bloch, Bloch said basically the left has uh, conceded to the right the, uh, the territory of myth. Uh, basically, the left had now, 68 is a revolt trying to discover myth somehow, to rediscover myth, to rediscover utopia. It is the rehabilitation of utopia. The old left is rigid, is frigid, is completely ossified, bo boring and sclerotic. They don't have anything to offer, Nes nothing more. You know, I was taking uh, lessons of French from a very uh, wonderful person, she was French, and uh, since there were no other newspapers in French at that moment in Romania, I, uh, probably you could buy Le Monde, but I, I didn't have access to Le Monde, so it was L'Humanité, and to learn French from L'Humanité, it was something. <laughs> okay, so it was so boring. I still remember la guerre, <coughs> I still remember in perfect French, I said, la guerre est un fléau contre lequel nous devons tous lutter. <laughs> it's French, but what does it mean? Okay, so okay, the war is a, 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 a scourge against which we need all to, to fight together. Okay, so that was the, <laughs> the French. Okay, so uh, another thing I think that, uh, uh, it's, I said, in my view, is the birth of Eurocommunism which means the disintegration of Western <laughs> Marxism or, or the Western Orthodox Marxism as well. Uh, force is a new political generation. Here I, you know, I got inspiration from a, uh, you know, a, um, a tale of two utopias, and it is indeed a, a several tales of utopias. It is a, a utopi it's a utopian generation, and it's clearly uh, fed up with the 
old utopias and they are looking for something brand new. Um, and many of the tab basically also it's something about 68. It's the great detabuization that takes place. The, all the taboos of the old world are somehow, you know, one of the f films that captures this pretty well, it's a movie, I think it was made with again, it's like La Nouvelle Vague, it's before, but it's Le Demoiselle de Chaubou. I mean, it's one of the, you know, it's the first musical, the big musical that changes completely the sensibility and so on, with Catherine Deneuve and her sister and so on, mu mu music by Michel Legrand and so on. It's a, mu it's, a, it's a film that changes, it's all in colors and so on. It's very, very much an, uh, announcing a generation, you know, uh, of, uh, of flowers and less, more flowers, less power. Okay, so uh, a new generation. Another point I want to make, and it's very much linked to 1989. I do s believe that 89, that's the reason I brought the World Marxist Review in the story and so on, because indeed the people who inspired Gorbachev are people who absorb the ideas of, nine, of Dubček and so on. I mean, uh, the uh, party intelligentsia, if you want, people around him are there and they are fascinated by these ideas. They try to attempt to say it didn't matter. Yes, it did matter. I, I actually, I don't know. I mean, uh, uh, the idea, you know, the famous joke at the moment Gorbachev comes to power and the, the, the joke both in Prague, in Rome and everywhere else. After all, the first Dubček interview comes out after 20 years of silence in Lunita. Uh, 1988, if I'm not wrong, right? 1988, and there's the famous speak of anniversary. The anniversary in 88. The joke at that moment was, what's the difference between Gorbachev and Dubček? And uh, there are two answers to this. One is 20 years, and the other one is uh, none whatsoever. But Gorbachev doesn't know it yet. Uh, so okay, but uh, so there is a big hope at that moment, and I think that indeed the fact that the revisionist Marxist becomes a czar changes completely the rules. The strategy of the new evolutionism that Michnik and his friends uh, designed was predicated, if I read correctly uh, the letters from prison, and I think I do, uh, it was predicated on the impossibility to do anything in these countries as long as the, as the center is controlled by the Brezhnev of this world. But if something fundamental changes at the center and the revisionist Marxist comes, everything can change it. You know, and here I agree with Mark. I mean, I don't know. I mean, the Soviet Union was doomed, probably, as the Soviet Union, as we know, but was doomed to <coughs> happen this way? Who knows? I mean, I believe, you know, to quote Michnik, actually, we invited him. He couldn't come to this conference. He would have been, of course, one of, uh, I wanted him very much to be here. And, uh, you know, he, he said once that, uh, uh, that, that uh, if he had learned anything during his lifetime, is that the Hegelian Marxist pretense of historical determinism doesn't mean anything. Uh, Hannah Arendt, since she was mentioned with this, I'll finish. Hannah Arendt, uh, in the Essays of understanding, on Understanding, at the end, quotes a wonderful, you'll not expect, uh, you'll see whom she quotes, and you, uh, obviously Jeff Isaac knows, but <laughs> other people who didn't spend that much time on Arendt probably would not know. She, ch she quotes Churchill, and uh, she says, you know, uh, he may be right. Uh, because Churchill says, I don't know, in 1947 or something like that, he says, of all the things that I was told during my education in high school or whatever that would not happen during my lifetime, all of them happened. And of all the things that I was told during my you know, school years that would happen didn't take place. So, uh, you know, Andrea Malrik wrote, will the Soviet Union survive 1984? Okay, he predicted. Uh, there were many reasons. You know, but if instead of Gorbachev, Grigory Romanov would have been elected first secretary in uh, general secretary in 1985, who knows? And so on and so forth. I mean, so basically it is, uh, oh, the last point, uh, critical intellectuals. A revolution of 1989 were revolutions. I mean, I agree with Tim Gordon Ash. I don't know if he still sticks to his view on that, but I agree that, and again, this is somebody who has written wonderfully about 68 and 89. Uh, uh, is there were revolutions of the intellectuals. The intellectuals played unique roles in, in, in 68. I mean, this was fundamentally, intellectuals basically were suddenly, uh, you know, the, uh, the class that mattered. And uh, with this being said, I, uh, Bogdan, maybe you want that. One. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> yeah, um, I, I would add just um, just one minute uh, remark. Um, I guess that uh, at most, what, what I could say was uh, is something related to myself as as as, uh, as a kid of the '90s, in the sense of what does '68 mean for me, and and I, I see it in in, in two ways um, mainly. Uh, one one of it, 68, is a research topic, and, but at the same time, it's very important because it relates to what um, uh, Agnes Scheller mentioned uh, in the sense of uh, the the intergenerational justice. And for the remaining case, the 60s, not 68 is the climax, but the 60s is basically the beginning of 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 of, um, um, of the politics of amnesia, which had have lasted in Romania at the official level until. 2006, December 2006, when the president of, of Romania condemned the, the communist regime. And what I mean by, by, by politics of amnesia is basically talking about the truth without telling the truth. And 60s are, as you'll, as you'll see in our paper, are about this, this, uh, this uh, issues related to the crimes, Stalinist crimes, and how to rehabilitate. And from there, many myths develop. And so, so that that's that's pretty much what I would what I would like to say. For me, as as a kid of the '90s, '68 is the chance for both critical historicization and uh, intergenerational justice. The hope for intergenerational justice. Okay, thank you. And uh, Agnes, can you please? A little bit First about what foremost, was the Cortula uh, dream. Uh, uh, Vladimir, your talk reminded me on the lengthy conversation you had with Ferenc Fahir, because you could go to converse about the matter of history of Soviet Union Romania for hours and hours and hours. And I, enj I always enjoyed uh, your knowledge of the detail and your enthusiasm of, of, of the problem itself. It was basically a very great spectacle. So I'm very happy that you mentioned Ferry uh, in this context. Now, two other questions I would uh, uh, here a little touch upon. Once upon a time, I called Ceausescu Benito. I called him Benito Ceausescu because it was my impression after I heard his funny the um, story in Chicxareda, Transylvania, that he, in a way, as a personality, is closer to Mussolini than to Stalin, or a kind of Stalinist functionary. Maybe you know the story of, of Chicxareda, I tell you briefly. In Chicxareda, some people were protesting against Ceausescu. What happened? Ceausescu arrived on a helicopter. The helicopter landed in a big stadium, people around him, and he said the following. This city of Chicxareda is under my protection. It is my city, and you will We'll get a hospital, and you will get that. We'll get an ice skate stadium, and they got the hospital, and they got the ice skate stadium, and that's a very Mussolini's gesture. No Kadar would ever do this because it, it is that you want to show that you are the real Führer. Of, of, of the people. And that's, of course, the balcony. When you speak about balcony, that's a balcony effect. Mussolini spoke also of the balcony. It's a balcony effect. You're up on the balcony. It's a very typical, I would not say that it was an Italian fascist regime, not at all. But the personality, in my mind, was very close to Mussolini, and that it must have influenced somehow his regime. Second, as a, when you spoke about uh, the demise of Marxism. Now, on the one hand, I don't believe it's a total demise. In Eastern Europe, there is a demise of Marxism, obviously. We, uh, and there were two kinds of demises. One was an abrupt change. Uh, someone spoke about, I think Paul Berman spoke about the language, language of the 19th century. There were some kind, certain kind of scholars who realized that they have to learn an entirely different language. They have to drop this language entirely. Uh, Kornoy, Janos Kornoy, the economist, told me that he went on to learn an entirely different language of economy because he knew he, in this language, he cannot tell anything what he believes to be true. But others, however, believed, behaved like a ship of Theseus. You know, from the ship of Theseus that, that years and years after years, all the 
parts of the ship had been replaced. No one single part remained the same, but the question the Greeks raised, was it still the ship of Theseus or was it not the ship of Theseus? The same kind of question can be raised when we speak about the kind of Marxians who have who it's have basically nothing to do with the original boat, but they somehow, somehow I still ask the question whether it's the same board or whether it's another board. But I would not speak about the demise of Marxism because we should not forget that, for example, in Latin America, in many states of Latin America, a kind of reinterpretation of Marx into the agenda. And I would even say not Marxism, but the figure of Karl Marx. I speak about the students. If you want to have a big class, in the new school you teach Marx, because their class will be huge. Uh, all students want to hear it. They have uh, book uh, workshops. It does not mean that you want to speak about in the language of 19th century. does not mean that you want to accept the pro uh, concept of the proletariat, the paradigm of production, because it's just, just something you cannot really address. But something from, uh, from a kind of spirit they derive from Karl Marx, namely uh, the spirit of outrage. That you, you have a kind of outrage. That outrage that, that but basically that was recursive, that outrage that French workers uh, life expectations 26 years. You know, outrage. And this sometimes you, you go to, uh, uh, this is the problem of the third world, this, because the expression I dislike, I think there is no such a thing as third world. There is no common feature between Argentina and, and uh, India and, uh, and uh, South Africa and uh, uh, Algeria. Absolutely nothing in common. They have totally different history. The, the whole expression is wrong. What made this an ideological device? Because it's an ideological vice device was basically the outrage. Outrage the how certain people live in a world in which a better life and a be better life is possible for us. Now this kind of outrage is there. And even if there is no the concrete analysis of the situations are not present. Even in countries of Eastern Europe where Marxism was dead for a long time. Your old friend uh, from Romania uh, Tomasz Gaspar Miklos speaks now the language of Karl Marx. You say that he's crazy. You can say that he's crazy. But he has followings. <laughs> he has followings as a crazy person because university students in Hungary start to be <laughs> radical. They are mostly right radical, very close to kind of fascism. And so uh, the Gaussi attracts the other part, which doesn't want to be right radical, but radical. So basically there is no such a thing as the last. You spoke about 68 and you said that was the last optimistic generation, maybe the latest. Well, how can you know that it is the last? Because we never know what's going to happen in the future. We have no idea that the Soviet regime is going to collapse before it collapsed. Five minutes because of collapse. You know, Ferry and myself, we already wrote, uh, knew about it. It's going to collapse, but the question was when. The question was, that's a very great question. It could have collapsed, for example, in, four, in 45. Why not? It could have collapsed after the death of Stalin. It could have collapsed in 56, after the Hungarian Revolution. Why exactly then did it collapse when it did collapse? Perhaps it could have survived. We have a conference next year. You, uh, you, can, you can explain everything. <laughs> uh, I think everything can be excellent, but you cannot explain a very contingency from history. Uh, yeah. okay. Mark, Mark Kramer. First, Vladimir, I, I would fully agree with the thrust of the paper with regard to the, uh, the balcony speech and in general in that period. I, I do think um, it is important to look at some of the events that came before, particularly, say, in 1967 with Israel and West Germany and, and um, continuing up. And that's probably it's some of that, I think, that lay behind Gromyko's comment because certainly the intelligence didn't support that. Romania was considering that step. But on, on the 21st of August, um, one of the, you're absolutely right. I mean, there's no indication that an invasion of Romania was ever um, considered or, or prepared. The Soviet Union did, I think, want to scare Ceausescu and, and succeeded in that because Ceausescu met on the 23rd, 26th, and 28th of August with the Soviet ambassador Basov 
and basically said to him, don't worry, we're not going to pull out of the Warsaw Pact. Um, we're, we're going to remain loyal, et cetera. So the, the high point of defiance came on the 21st of August, and basically it receded after that, it, as I, you uh, discussed in the paper. On, on the question of whether 1968 and 1989, I, w I would be cautious about this. I, I, as I looked at um, some of those, uh, like uh, Georgi Arbatov and Vladimir Lukin, those were two where I could actually trace the documentary record of what they had thought and said in 1968, because they had claimed that they had opposed the invasion. I, you know, the record suggests the opposite, especially with Arbatov, that he was aggressively supportive of it. If you look at one of Gorbachev's most influential advisors on foreign policy, Alexander Yakovlev, his role in 1968 as deputy head of the propaganda department was to oversee the reimposition of censorship and ideological conformity in, in Czechoslovakia. Um, even with, you know, with Gorbachev, I mean, Mlinas, regardless of his role in 1968, uh, it, back when he knew Gorbachev at MGU was, uh, as he described it in his memoir before Gorbachev became well known, and Gorbachev's not mentioned in the memoir, and Mlinas himself says that when he was at MGU, he was a sincerely convinced Stalinist. Um, so whatever they may have discussed at that point, I'm not convinced that it was a prelude to 1968. And the, the link between 1968 and 1989, I think is tempting because so much of what was done um, does seem to uh, emulate what was being done in Czechoslovakia. But the, um, if, if you look at the memoirs of people afterward and they talk about how they were disillusioned by the invasion of Czechoslovakia, I'm always a little bit worried about that because they undoubtedly were after the Soviet Union broke apart as they look back. But whether they truly were at the time and had that influence on Gorbachev, I'm more skeptical. Steve Morris. Okay, and then Jan. Yeah, um, I'd just like to make a general comment flowing from everything I've heard this afternoon. Um, it seems to me there were two positions presented here. One was that uh, the, this 1968 was a, had a commonality between West and East, and the other point of view was the opposite, that there was no commonality. And I'd just like to say, as somebody who lived through this, at least in the West, I'm very, very much committed to the proposition that there was no commonality that East European revisionism flowed out of the best democratic traditions of Western civilization, uh, even the humanistic side of Marx, whilst West, Western radicalism, although initially in places like the Port Huron Statement, seemed to, me, seemed to be a purer form of liberalism in the Western tradition, eventually morphed, uh, beginning especially in 1968, into a form of totalitarianism. In other words, that the two movements went in opposite directions. And um, nothing better illustrates it than the way in which some of the principal figures behaved in their lives. Let me say more generally, though, uh, and I want to refer to Tom Hayden in a moment, but um, one of the si signers of the Port Huron Statement. But those of us who lived through it know very well what the New Left represented in terms of freedom in the university. They're against freedom of the university. They're in favor of a certain point of view being imposed. They were in favor of suppressing certain points of view which they considered uh, incorrect, historically incorrect. Now, I came to Columbia University in 1976 from Australia. I experienced the 60s in Australia, which was a carbon copy of what happened in the United States. When I came to Columbia, I just experienced the backwash of the 1968 experience and the new in America through the, during the experience of the attempt to appoint Henry Kissinger to a position in the political science and which the new left came out and attempted to intimidate everybody in the university, uh, including the political science department, which had voted 20 to 4 in favor of Kissinger's appointment, not to appoint him because he was a war criminal. Many of you, many of you who are old enough will know that during the, the late 60s and early 70s, of course, disruption of lectures in the universities was a common thing. Not just disruption of conservatives, but disruption of the lectures of liberals. Because as it was said at the time, the problem with you liberals is that you make capitalism and imperialism seem human. Um, 
Now, to go, to go to Tom Hayden, to give another example, and why I think that the, the, the diversion between the new left and its 1968 experience and what was called the civil rights movement, which was part of the Western cultural and liberal tradition, became very apparent. Tom Hayden, of course, formed with his uh, poor wife of the time, uh, Jane Fonda, something called the Indochina Peace Campaign. And it's ti the title of their magazine called um, uh, Focal Point was taken from a speech by uh, Trong Chin, uh, who was the leading Stalinist ide ideologue in Vietnam. And it's very illustrative that they would choose a Stalinist ideologue as one of their icons because the New Left by 1972 had been totally committed to the Stalinist experience in Vietnam and in Cuba. And in 1978-79, when the experience of the boat people came forth in, this, uh, in the world, and I was involved again uh, in some of these events, there was a bifurcation. The civil rights activists were on the side of the boat people and the New Left were on the side of the Stalinist dictatorship in Vietnam. Tom Hayden and Jane Fonda were at the forefront of attempting to discredit uh, the reports of human rights violations in Vietnam, whilst Joan Baez, who was the leader a pacifist and a figure very central to the civil rights movement in the early 60s, was in favor of trying to redress the grievance and the horrors of the boat people. Um, and I know this from personal experience because I was involved with Joan Baez at the time. Now, I want to, I want to say to you, the, the, the truth of the reality of the New Left is very, very clear. Not just this despicable Bill Ayers, who was a terrorist, who was a minority of the New Left, a very small minority who embraced violence, but the majority, as represented by Tom Hayden, became, uh, and who became elected, of course, to the California State Senate, believed in the virtues of totalitarian states. Uh, just a brief comment, uh, you know, also some, some people uh, persevere in uh, their delusions and some people see the light. Uh, I can give you from France a different example. Some people who were in love, infatuated with, the, um, with Maoism and the Cultural Revolution, like Julia Christeva and Philippe Solers, who after 1970, basically in s after 75, became very strong critics of totalitarianism and so on. So I think that we should look, I mean, obviously you know the history of the American New Left pretty well. I know I come from this one. I mean, there are things published by Christopher Solers in 67, 68, which are absolutely outrageous, but they move beyond that. So we, we will see. Uh, uh, no, Jan Werner Müller first, and then Carol Sultan and Jeff Isaac. Yeah, sorry. I just wanted for a second to return to a question which came up yesterday and which I think was sharpened today by Agnes Heller and Dick Howard. Namely the question to what extent the process of de-radicalization of European intellectuals after 1968 uh, can usefully be described with liberalism as an analytical as opposed to normative concept. It seems to me that the answer to that question will also to some degree determine the significance of 68, uh, as Charles Mayer put it. It seems to me there are at least two problems with liberalism as that kind of concept. One is that a lot of the protagonists would, of course, have refused that label. Uh, two obvious examples, the anti-totalitarians that Dick Howe talked about, but for instance, also the personalists to, uh, to whom uh, Carol Zoltan referred yesterday. The second one, though, maybe more serious, is that I think there's a good argument that what emerges uh, if you like, what triumphs at the end of the 20th century in Western Europe, I'm not talking about the US and what liberalism means there, but in the European context, what triumphs is in a sense a new balance, you might say, between liberalism and democracy. Uh, it's not simply the revival, either in terms of ideas, let alone a social base, of liberalism as it was known before. It's something quite radically new and it also includes a kind of democratization of everyday life, which wasn't there in the past. I think somebody who's made this, much more this point much more eloquently than me in this rather crude fashion now is Marcel Gaucher in this sort of monumental history of democracy in the 20th century, which he's now bringing out, where he's trying to convince us that actually what we find at the end of the 20th century is a kind of new synthesis of liberal and democratic principles plus something new thrown in uh, that only emerges after 68. That doesn't necessarily vindicate 68 because it was also in a sense an attack on some of these principles, but I think we somehow conceptually have to get beyond a single ism or a single thing uh, that, uh, that captures this de-radicalization. 
Thank you. Carol Sultan, Jeff Isaac is there. Okay, and uh, Balash, and I think that would be it because. Hmm? Yeah. Okay, Carol. Um, just in, in response to, to your comment at the media provocation, uh, it's, it, look, it's, it's, you can't really think of 60 apart from 60s and, you know, 60s and just 60s. And if, if you think that way, then there is obviously at least one deep divide, which you allude to as East versus West, but it's not really East versus West, as your comments uh, suggest, because a lot of your examples of the good, uh, on the good side were from the West. So yes, there is a deep divide, but it's not really temporal. It's somewhat temporal. It's not East versus West. It is, uh, I, I, as I put it, you know, it's, it's your attitude toward limits. If you're, you know, if, you, if you're concerned for the, the person, the creative agent, is, a, uh, is the idea that creation is, uh, uh, it needs to be self-limiting, then you're on one side. If you're the limit smasher, you know, the purest type of creation is smashing limits, then, then you're on the other side, and it can be quite violent. But it's, it's not east versus west, it's not early versus late, it's somewhat east versus west, it's somewhat early versus, but it depends where, you know, it, it varies. I think that's the, the fundamental uh, uh, divide, and, and, and the, the project that is shared is, I, 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 I agree, it's not really liberalism, it's not really democracy, because there are Democrats on all sides, and liberalism doesn't quite uh, capture it. So I, 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 I think, you know, again, that's, that's I, I went to creative agency. Um, uh, you know, that, that, that suggests a, a particular concept of democracy, which, again, divided between the unlimited and limited, but still different from sort of the realists who think like Schumpeter or like uh, pluralists. It's a different notion of what democracy is that is more liable to, to idealism rather than, than uh, to realism. I think, so, so I, I actually, and this came I, w when I was preparing paper for, for this conference, I, I, I realized there's actually more unity 60s. I, I initially thought this completely, you know, how can I bring the 60s into, into the context where I, I, I was concerned with the 40s and the 80s and the 60s seemed complete an outlier, but they aren't a complete outlier because they're deeply divided. But in fact, when you look back uh, and forward, uh, now in the 40s, the Chinese Revolution, I mean, there, there, is, there is a con continuity of this, of this great divide. So it's not East versus West, it's this two versions of, a, of, a, of what I would think is actually a new, new project of, of taking seriously human creative potential against the iron cage of labor. Okay, uh, just, like Steve, just, uh, just a tiny point. I think that the civil rights movement, which I believe was a great expression of American dem democracy and Western civilization, uh, preceded the late 60s. It was early 60s. Then 68 was the, the movement of the late 60s, and then I think you see from then on the bifurcation. The, the, whilst some of these people were involved in the civil rights movement who became the new left, they made their own separate course and their own separate agenda. Okay, we'll have all, also discussions during the whatever happy hour after that. Jeff Isaac, please. <laughs> well, I, I guess I'd like to push Carol's point just a little bit. I'd like to push Carol's point a little bit further and, and really uh, very briefly in the spirit of what Agnes Heller said. Uh, these questions, does the term liberalism or democracy capture what's going on or what do we mean by the new left? It seems, these are gross categories. It seems to me that like th the worst thing we could do as serious intellectuals or scholars is end a conference like this by taking a position that the new left is X or the new left is Y. The, the new left is a complicated concept that emerged in the 1960s. When we talk about it, we're talking about it at remove. It means many things. And in fact, probably we need to have real serious discussions to even get clearer what we mean when we use the term. I th so t to use it to vilify uh, political enemies in this way, I just think is kind of contrary to the spirit of this conference. And I think Agnes Heller, who, well, I don't know, is she East or West? Um, she said that you can't really, uh, you can't really uh, know the meaning of events. I think that would apply to the question, what does the new left mean? Uh, and I, by the way, I think to some extent the question, what does the new left mean, is a question that's still open, which is why we're here. Otherwise, we wouldn't be talking about it. Okay. Uh, Balash, 
Uh, let me just make a brief comment to Vladimir's uh, description about Ceausescu's attitude to the suppression of the Prague Spring. I think it's worth to put it into a global context again, because during that time we have a kind of amazing and surprising sight, you know, that we have maybe two of the very worst Stalinist regimes of that time, Albania down here in Southeast Europe and North Korea down up, you know, in Northeast Asia. And they had diametrically opposed attitude to, to uh, the event. You know, Albania denounced it and said, this is the worst Soviet imperialism and they jo just left the Warsaw Pact. In contrast, the North Koreans started pressing war, uh, for some kind of intervention much before that the Soviets even really seriously thought of. I mean, a Hungarian delegation went there around the spring uh, by f sheer irony, headed by maybe the one of the most conservative members of the Hungarian party leadership, Arpad Pulai, who was described widely as a blockhead. And he was in a strange situation that he had to defend the Czechoslovak comrades against Foreign Minister Pak Song Chol, who kept hammering on, almost you know, foaming at the mouth, that you can see, you can see, they lost the control, and you can see the, the imperialist infiltration is going on, you need strong party control. It was so strange, you know. And I think it's worth putting uh, Ceausescu's attitude into this context because Enver Hoxha was then more democratic than Kim Il-sung. Was then Albania kind of more enlightenment? Possibly the question was not the relationship to the Prague Spring. The relationship was to the great powers, for example, the Soviet Union. If you look at the speech, what Chinese foreign minister, I mean, uh, sorry, Prime Minister Zhu Enlai made around that time at the Romanian embassy, how he looked this event, completely from the perspective of international relations, of the East-West struggle. Of course, he mixed up things because one time he said, oh, uh, this is uh, the evidence for a U.S.-American conflict because uh, Dubček wanted to sell out Czechoslovakia to the West, to the East West Germans, to America, and the um, Russians wanted to prevent it. And then in the next sentence he said, this is the evidence for U.S. and Soviet cooperation. So mixed up. But I think basically the attitude of Ceausescu was not so much rooted in his attitude toward the Czechs, much more his attitude toward the Soviets. Around that time, it was almost impossible for the Chinese or the Albanians to say anything good about the Soviet Union. Whatever the Soviets said was bad. And uh, I think we may have Ceausescu around more or less in the same situation, possibly. Not because he had uh, any kind of enthusiasm for the Prague Spring. Uh, thank you, Balash. Thanks, everybody. First of all, uh, in the paper we developed, because 68, there are many similarities between what Ceausescu does and what Dubček does. Until January 1968, Ceausescu was universal described as the youngest leader of the Warsaw Pact system. So he was born 1918, so that made a very important generational difference. Uh, Brezhnev was 1906, I don't remember all the other ones. Ulbricht was clearly in his 70s already and so on. So basically, okay, Dubček comes and he's, you know, the youngest, he's 47 at the moment, he's elected or 45 or something like that. Uh, what is one of the first things the Czechs do? That's the appointment, we go into this, uh, they appoint the Pillar Commission for the Rehabilitation of the Victims of Stalinism. Uh, Ceausescu appoints also in 1968 the commission that led to the rehabilitation of Patrashkanu and the victims of Stalinism in Romania. Much of it didn't come out in the media and some, but there was also a internal party rehabilitation of Anna Pauker, Luca Laszlo and the rest, which was not published, but the document exists that they rehabilitated many others, including the victims of the Great Terror that was published. 
the Romanian, including uh, Christian Rakowski, for instance, who had been executed, in, you know, yeah, fi- d- died in prison in 1940, sentenced to, he was 75 when he was sentenced in the Bukharin trial to, I don't know, 20 years in prison, and they li- liquidated him in 19... Uh, he was of Romanian origin, as the reason I mentioned, so he was rehabilitated in Bucharest, although he played an important role in Russian Soviet history, I mean, he was the first prime minister of Soviet Ukraine and then ambassador to France and all the rest. Okay, so they were rehabilitated by Ceausescu. So that appeared very much, but the Pillar Commission went much deeper in, in the criticism of the Stalinists. Okay, uh, we also give, and this Bogdan who discovered it, because he took day by day, Skante, I don't, you know, I remember many things of that period, but he spent all the time uh, with this, and he discovered it would have been unthinkable in Czechoslovakia to have a uh, Dubček in, what, in May, let's say, participating in the 20th anniversary <laughs> of the creation of the secret police. In Romania, you have Ceausescu delivering a very nice speech t- congratulating the Securitate on the occasion of it tw- its 20th anniversary. So clearly, very divergent path. I mean, in reality, not the, uh, the most important document, the p- action program of the Communist Party of Czechoslovakia that came out, what, April? Okay, was published very in a very fragmentary... It was a description only description of, of what I was saying. Uh, okay. Needless to say, forget about uh, the 2,000 words or things like that, no. So basically what we could find out about what was going there was primarily via le, the French communist um, literary magazine that Pierre Dex was the editor of, uh, Lettre Française. So Lettre Française had a lot of stuff about that, be also Dex being the son-in-law of Arthur London, who was a, you know, one of the three survivors of the Slansky trial and so on. So uh, there was a special interest in Czechoslovakia there, and so we, we could find out more. I, uh, last thing, in uh, the Soviet Communist Party Congress took place, if I'm not wrong, uh, um, uh, no, it's not the Congress, the 1969 part, uh, World Communist Conference, the last one. Mm-hmm. On that occasion, Brezhnev's speech is quite interesting. There are several speeches. Uh, Berlinguer gave, uh, I think it was Berlinguer already, who gave the speech on, uh, on behalf of the Italian party. Ascario gave a very important, because the issue was like Czechoslovakia never existed. June 69, as if it never happened. Husak, of course, gives his uh, you know, uh, litany of praise for the Soviet Union. And, uh, but Brezhnev singles out the revisionists. Revisionism is singled out as the most important danger within world communism. And he mentions uh, very interesting people because they are mentioned by name in Brezhnev's speech. Uh, so it's uh, in uh, country and name. So you have, I don't know if the Budapest School is mentioned there, but it's country and name. The Praxis group is mentioned and so on. And he goes that far into details that he even mentions Teodoro Petkov from Venezuela. I mean, it's, you know, he goes very far into, <laughs> into the, who is Mr. Pa- Chavez's main critic these days in, in, in Caracas. Uh, okay, so it's uh, so clearly for them it was truly the most. I mean, the really the intervention was because they couldn't take this kind of revival of a certain type of, you know, Stephen mentioned, let's say the libertarian, anti authoritarian Marx. I mean, that existed, which, you know, uh, uh, I also have the experience that students are very interested in, 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 in reading Karl Marx. And there's a lot of, you know, it's not that I never said that Karl Marx is dead, I said a certain ism is dead. I mean, Karl Marx. You know, I had an exchange years ago with uh, Gary Markush, and he, I quoted him in the book that you nicely, re- you know, were the re- reviewer for the book, and uh, the crisis of Marxism in Eastern Europe. And Markush actually told me, I mean, Marxism is a part of a cycle of modernity. And like every single cycle of modernity comes and goes, but you cannot simply say that disappears. That ne- you know, uh, Aurelian Kreutzu gave here a wonderful presentation, and he spoke about, you know, how can, if Benjamin Constant reemerges, if Guizot reemerges, and so on, it's very hard to imagine that some of the ideas, I mean, we are engaged with, uh, under the guidance of my dear friend Jeff Isaac in this project to publish a new version. No, no, the version is the same, a new edition <laughs> of the Communist Manifesto's comments from Stephen Lux, from myself, from Jeff, from uh, Saskia Sassen. I mean, uh, people who, you know, uh, there is a lot to say there. I mean, you know, you read it, I think I read it so many times, so there is a lot. There's a poetry there, there's a lot of craziness, obviously, if you read it with the eyes of somebody who knows what the 20th century has been about, uh, you know, destroying the property, destroying the family, and we know that some people tried it, and some uh, last, uh, absolutely last comment is that, uh, yes, is Albania, Balash, you, since you mentioned Albania and North Korea, I don't remember exactly North Korea either, and North Vietnam, how they reacted. Probably, l- prob- uh, by the way, th- how did North Vietnam react? They supported the invasion. They supported the invasion in spite of the Chinese content. It's very interesting. 
Okay, but uh, Cuba is interesting because uh, Fidel gave a kind of tongue-in-cheek endorsement. I mean, it was uh, basically, it was not a co enthusiastic and full-fledged, but that brought basically Fidel back into Moscow's graces. I mean, that was, this was the price for Fidel to be reaccepted and receive all kinds of, but he gave something like basically um, that this, you know, they are all wrong, but the Czechs were even worse than the Soviets, something like that. So it was not a kind of uh, general applause. And also there were lots of interesting, uh, it's, it's one of the most uh, interesting crises, speaking of crisis of world communism. And uh, I, uh, I do think now if I, if I look into the questions about East-West, uh, I think that one of the best books I always refer to it, I think is the, the books of uh, text by Agnes and uh, Ferenc about Eastern, Eastern left, Western left. I mean, there, f some of you may remember, there was a special issue of the New German Critique about during the, was it during the missile deployment, no? It was at the, mo the moment. Uh, that but they wrote a piece which was enormous, the response to Peter Brandt, which was, uh, was calling for the neut neutral unification via neutralization of Germany. I forget all the details, but basically, and Ferenc and Agnes responded to an article, what was Eastern Europe under shell of a new Rapallo. It was a very important article, and it provided a lot of ammunition because it was as important in my view, and not only my view, it circulated a lot in Eastern Europe, as the famous Anatomy of a Reticence by Havel his open letter to the Western, well, to a Western pacifist. This was a clear point, said very directly, with no, you know, no, 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 no uh, exaggerated politeness and so on. Hey guys, uh, as Havel says, if there is one country that waged war in Europe during the last 40 years, its name is not the United States. And it's a country that occupied another country. It's the Soviet Union is occupied 56, occupied 68, occupied and so on. So, you know, so Havel's letter was very, you know, in no uncertain terms formulated. And, uh, you know, but as the, be this being said, I think that, uh, and this is the conversation between Michnik and Cohn Bendit in uh, La Revolution ou la Vente when Michnik says, listen, how can you expect me to be against the Vietnam War? When for me, the uh, war was about a, uh, uh, a basically the North Vietnamese dicta dictatorship trying to impose it through its branch, whatever, through its weapon, which was Viet Cong and so on, to basically turn Vietnam into a unified communist dictatorship. I, it was hard for me to participate in such a thing when I had the Soviet troops on my territory and I knew something. So this being said, I think that at the deeper level of uh, values, which are, let's call them in Gorbachev's terminology, universal human values, I think that East and West, North and South at that moment experienced similar, uh, very similar search for a new set of values. So uh, not everything is uh, strictly political. So I, I would go into the deeper human implications. Thank you very much.